The retirement that our parents had probably is not going to be the same shape of retirement that we have. If you're relying on auto-enrolment and you want a retirement which might be similar to what you'd expected, you're probably going to fall short. George Agan is a chartered financial planner who's helped thousands of people to plan for their financial future. There's little things like that sound minor and they do take some discipline but they can have an enormous impact on how much you actually can save over your life what's a young person got that somebody who's at 65 doesn't have time so one thing that makes you quite unique is the fact that you're of our age so you're our generation but yep. you deal with people in the main that are near retirement or of previous generations and what we want to explore today is the challenges that face younger generations and why that might be different to, say, your typical client and what they can do about it. Can we start really broad and, and maybe just talk about what do you think the differences are between the people that walk into you and sit down near retirement and the people who are just getting started on that journey? Yeah, sure. And the differences are enormous, frankly. Um, there's no two ways of getting around it. Like, if you think about... Simplified thing, house to price ratio, house price to earnings ratios are eight, nine times. So it's very difficult for people to get onto the housing ladder. In relation to our relationship with our employer, you know, going back to baby boomers, and, and I want to say not all baby boomers, everyone's individual, but as a generalization, you know, baby boomers had a much more secure relationship with their employer, much more consistent job for life. You know, kind of people literally could have a job where you'd get the gold watch at the end of 30, 35 years work. We millennials and Gen, Gen and Z uh, have a much more transactional relationship. We don't have as much security. Uh, as far as a pension system setup, defined benefit schemes were generally available for quite a, a large cohort of uh, baby boomers. They're fundamentally not for millennials, uh, with the exception of people who might work in the public sector or be very lucky in the private sector. So what that has meant is that it's mean that there's been a a fundamental change onto what retirement is going to be for like for somebody of millennial or gen z age and the key thing that i would kind of like to articulate with that is that it really is up to you as the individual the onus has gone from potentially having quite a lot of security through an employer to potentially being all on to the individual I I don't want to, you know, like you say, we don't want to generalise. And I think it's 10% of boomers and, and have like nothing, essentially. There's a lot, yeah. you know, it's not everyone stepped on. But do you think that it's, as in generalisation, that it was easier then for those people to have a comfortable retirement without thinking about it? I think the word easier can do a lot of heavy lifting. And I think you're absolutely right in relation to the fact that we can't really generalise for an entire population. What we can say, though, is that what we've got now in relation to, um, you know, our retirement for millennials, if you think about kind of the things that are affecting us, we are going to live longer, which is a good thing. You know, longevity is a really key element. We have auto enrollment, which has been a huge success, but um, it's going to get us nowhere near the type of retirement um, that we might want. You know, I did some research recently for a video and it basically assumed you had someone who got the median wage consistently all the way from age 23 to 60 at retirement and assuming they aggress uh, invested aggressively, the money ran out if they wanted to retire at 60, age 69. What you've done there is a cash flow model, right? Yeah, yeah, effectively. So what it assumes is somebody from day one, from 23, earns the median wage, which is around £31,000. It assumes they get the auto-enrollment minimum based on qualifying earnings, so it's 8%. And it assumes that they don't make any bump-ups, they literally just contribute, and then the return they get is 5% real. So that's after inflation and charges assumed as well. Now, just for some historic context, it's 5.3% real as far as 1900 to 2022, as far as global equity. So it's not an unrealistic uh, return expectation. What that assumes, if that individual then retired at 60, is the money would run out at 69. And the key conclusion is, if you're relying on auto-enrollment and you want a retirement which might be similar to what you'd expected, you're probably going to fall short. So you're basically saying, because I do think that a lot of people listening, maybe not listening to this, but a lot of people out there, the only retirement saving they're doing is auto-enrollment. Yeah. And you don't think that that's enough? I think it's important to recognise that it will depends on expectations. And one of the things we're going to be touching on a little bit later is perhaps what enough is, because it's so individual. It's literally one of the next questions. So. Yeah. <laughs> <It's tea's> question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Taking my shine. Yeah, yeah. Enough is is frankly why I'm in a job. You know, my, my job for my clients is basically to find out what is enough for you. 
Uh, and that is the key thing. And it's so individual. You know, I uh, when I did a video and I used the retirement living standards um, data just as a guide, and uh, yeah, the, one of the first comments was, this is total bollocks. Why are you using this? Because they're just scaring everyone. And he, he's right. You know, the person I'm saying here, I'm just unconscious bias there. It was an angry person. I'm assuming it's a guy. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I was, I was like, yeah, it's, it's true. But what the retirement living standards do very well is they put a stake in the ground and someone has to put a stake in the ground. But ultimately, yeah, it's going to be in high, it's going to be highly individual as far as what your expenditure is. Um, and that's going to really impact your retirement planning. But now we're all living longer. So does that mean we're going to be working longer? Retirement age is going to be later. And then like Damien said, how much do you need in retirement now? Because if you're living longer, your retirement's not going to be maybe 10, 15 years anymore. It might be 30 30 years. So yeah. how do you know how much you need? Well, not if you party like me and Damo, but <laughs> most people will have a long retirement, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I'm sat here with an ABBA t-shirt on, mate. I don't think anyone's <laughs> believing that I party hard anymore. <laughs> they ain't seen the socks either. <laughs> I got the ABBA socks on. Oh, you got ABBA socks on yeah, as well? Yeah, I saw yeah. them on Dana's Instagram. Gonna, gonna, yeah, yeah, mix, yeah. Mix, yeah ma mix matching ones. Yeah, just so I can bring two of the crew to the party. <laughs> Anyway, sorry, yeah. How, how do people know how much they'll, they'll need? I think the, 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 you can use some simple heuristics just to get the ball rolling. That's the simplest thing. Uh, shortcuts, mental shortcuts. Okay, yeah. I yeah. can even pronounce hu heuristics. Yeah, heuristics. Heuristics. Yeah, nice yeah, I don't get to hit that very often. So yeah. that's great. You were yeah, quick yeah. with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can just use some simple, you know, they, they say like the 4% rule um, and they say, uh, the best way I've heard that described is saying it's a terrible rule but a brilliant guideline. I think that's true. I personally prefer the rule of 375, which I took from a guy at Dimensional. And basically the problem is with the 4% rule is no one has a single idea what they spend every year. You don't have a clue. The rule of 300, if you times your monthly income by 300, that's basically the 4% rule. But what the rule of 375 does is it basically facts in taxation. Because one of the things that everyone does with the 4% rule is they assume that taxation and charges don't exist. And they do. So what 375 does is effectively factor in 20% inflation on the withdrawals. So you're multiplying your monthly gross income mm -hmm. by 375. Yep. And that gives you a total pot figure. Correct. And uh, then you would draw 4% from that as yeah, a... Yeah, well, just remember, this is a savings guide, not a withdrawal strategy. Yeah. So if you think about it, okay, how much am I generally going to need? The best place to start, and this is what I would do with a client, if they, if they don't really follow their finances really closely, let's just start with the basics, which is, okay, what, um, how much money do you have left over? Really simple question. You know, what do you get paid? How much money do you have no. left over? Exactly. <laughs> no, he's like, left over? Yeah. <laughs> what Negative. is this? <laughs> what, what, is, what is this concept? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that's the case, fine. But then obviously we need to factor in, um, especially if we're considering retirement planning, there may be things that don't have, uh, exist in your retirement. You might have mortgages now that you're potentially going to have paid off. There's going to be other changes. But that's going to give you, if you think about what money is spare, you know, minus the savings versus what you're, you're, you're getting in, that is a reasonable guide. Times that by 375. So just to give you an idea, that's two grand net would be 750,000. Three grand would be 1,125,000. So it's going to be a really big, scary figure is the truth. But that assumes that you're then going to never need to work a day in your life. And I believe that the structure of retirement for younger people is going to be completely different. Yeah. And I think that's, I, I kind of, I, I hope that's an empowering message um, because I think that does give opportunity. But I also do kind of want to really acknowledge when we're talking about this is everything I'm going to say is using my expertise as a planner. It is not going to be a solution to everyone's problems. Yeah. I also acknowledge that a lot of people are genuinely in really difficult situation right now financially. I kind of hope that the things that we talk about are going to be useful even just to think about as a framework, but I'm not suggesting at all that they're answers to everyone's problems. No, I think what you, what from reading the notes and things and listening to you talk, what, what you're just trying to do is say these are the things that you can, the levers and the things that you can do to try and Correct. have a better retirement. And I think what people forget about retirement is that really it's a, it's a modern day invention in the, the format. The Romans introduced like a payment for soldiers to get them to go to war. But I think the industrial revolution was when basically factory owners said, this guy here is 70 still working on the line and he's very unproductive. We need to put a younger person in there so that they work harder on the machine. 
and the guy who was 70 was like, I, I, I can't afford to stop. I, need, I work till I die. So they basically incentivized them to leave. And that's the retirement. And those individuals were broken physically. So they were stopped at retirement. You know, they didn't do any more work. And I think we had this big boom in the 50s with economic output that led to people having retirements where golden years, that kind of yeah. branding. And I think it, it, a lot of people hold on to that idea and they think they deserve that. But I actually think if you look at people in retirement, my granddad is an example, my mom who recently retired, they go back to work because they desire something. And I don't think, I think if we say to ourselves, I might be flexible, I might work, it might not be this idea of golden years where I stop, but it's, you know, that that can be a positive thing. I don't I, think it's negative. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And, and also I think one of the things that, maybe people haven't articulated, but I am seeing a lot from like younger individuals I speak to, I've got a few younger clients and so forth, is that we do, I think everyone, the idea of waiting 30 years to enjoy your life, I think is something that most people- We've rejected that. I think that, we've yeah. rejected that. It was that, old yeah. school thinking. And if you think about that and why we would reject that, well, basically it's very, very hard for people to get onto the housing ladder and they're having to make serious trade-offs. So live for today, but not at the expense of tomorrow. And I think that's really important because at the end of the day, you, you know, you don't want to be in a position where you're working all your life. You know, this is what I fundamentally disagree about the FIRE approach is the financial independence retire early thing is a lot of it is born on frugality. And of course, if, if, that, if that's your bag, enjoy it. Of course, you know, I'm not going to tell you how to live. But I don't think it makes as much sense. I think I would much rather use a combination of tactics so that I'm enjoying and I'm crafting my life around as much as maybe I can afford to put away. But I'm not then thinking, oh, no, I can't wait till I'm 50, 55, and I can, you know, give up work. You sent me a meme earlier uh, before this conversation <laughs> did, where it was like it? an old guy was like, young guy filling his pension, and then it cut to him as old. He's like, great, I got billions in here, but what the fuck am I going to do? My knees are broke. Like, like we should spend it when you were young. Yeah, and I think exactly. I, I, I have to check that. Like, you know, honestly. I'm I, always encouraging him to blow his money. On me, yeah. ideally. No, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, like yeah. Uh, we spoke to the plain bagel guy. Yeah, um, oh, did I you? Richard Coffin. Yeah. Richard Coffin, yeah, yeah, yeah. and he was talking all about frugality. I think a lot of people our age, delayed gratification isn't really something that comes with our generation. It's a lot like Instagram, immediate likes. Like I want to raise now. I want this now. Everyone wants things like yesterday. So the concept of just living a frugal life so you can enjoy later in life, I don't think. But we're constantly resonates. told. You're not saving enough, save more, yeah. save more. So I think there's that kind of yeah. contradiction. Well, exactly. Isn't there? Basically, there's, you know, everyone's in this kind of juxtaposition where you've got people vomiting their wealth over you 24 hours a day on mm. TikTok, Instagram, you know, going to these incredible restaurants and all the rest of it. And then you've got idiots like me coming on to podcasts and being like, oh no, 16% saving rate, just do that. <laughs> yeah. So you've, you've got to customize it for you. I think kind of my, the, one of the things I, I always try and do, especially if I speak to anyone younger on a planning sense, is that okay, you might not be able to save 16% of your income right now, but do you know what's really valuable? Your financial habits. So if I can get you operating and basically adopting really solid financial habits, that compounds, you know, Damien, with your savings rate, you didn't start day one with a really high savings rate. Right. That's probably something that improved over time. And that's exactly it. And then one of the things <clears throat> on the video that I did where it started as, you know, the person's running out of money at age 69, this is dreadful. One of the most powerful levers was basically they just, every time they got a bump on their pay uh, pay scale, they put a percentage aside. So it's little things like that sound minor and they do take some discipline, but they can have an enormous impact on how much you actually can save over your life. Yeah. And, I, and I, so from, from my personal example, I started say like £20, £50 a month or something mm -hmm. back when, back in my, my 20s. And I beat myself up because it wasn't 50, 60%. But like you said, I established a habit. And, and as my income's grown, the saving rate's grown with it a lot. And it's, it's about having that faith in your own ability long-term to earn more money and to improve the situation. And it doesn't mean that you shouldn't start today, you know. So I want to now look at, I think most people listening to this understand that retirement planning is important. But I, I think the way you've created the, or you might have created them or you might have stolen them, but we'll, we'll give you credit. The Borrowed from a yeah, friend called yeah, Andy. Yeah, yeah. Plagiarised. Yeah. Yeah. Lightly, yeah. lightly plagiarised. Adapted. 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 Standing on the shoulders of giants. A true artist. <laughs> yeah, a true yeah, artist. Exactly. Well, you've, you've put together these kind of frameworks and different ways of thinking about things that might flesh out how people can approach this in their life if they're just starting. 
I want to start with the three ways that you look at building wealth. Sure. We'll go through each one if that's okay and of just course. have a chat about them and when people might use them. The first one is asset focused. So do you want to just tell us what that means? Yeah. So, so this is the traditional kind of financial industry, financial planning, personal finance, whatever tactics, which is basically um, financial planning can be really complicated. But if you think about it as effectively like four quadrants of earn, spend, own and owe, they're the four quadrants which dominate your life and money. Effectively, very simply, one day that earnability is going to go away. At some point, it will. It's going to be very difficult to earn throughout your entire life. Now, in your normal working life, what you're earning is paying for what you spend and also maybe what you owe if you have like a mortgage. At a certain point, though, we ideally need to be in a position where what you own, the other part of the quadrant, can pay for what you spend. And that, in a nutshell, is what we need to do with financial planning. We need to make sure that you're investing over time so that you have the ability so that one day, if you decide to maybe reduce your hours or maybe you know, you're know you not in the ability to earn as much, your assets can potentially pay for that. And that's the asset focused approach. So, so how can we do that? Are you building a SaaS or venture back business or just trying to grow abroad? Well, if potential customers or investors haven't asked already about ISO 27001, SOC 2 or GDPR compliance, they probably will soon. Achieving compliance can unlock major growth for your company, but the process is often you know, intensive and costly. This is where our partner Vanta comes in. Vanta automates up to 90% of compliance work, getting you audit ready in weeks instead of months and saving you significant costs. Also, Vanta scales with your business, helping you successfully enter new markets and land bigger deals. They already have over 7,000 customers, including big names like Cora and Flow Health. As a special offer, Making Money listeners can get $1,000 off Vanta by going to vanta.com slash making money. There's a link in the description for you. Well, basically, there's, there's a ton of options. Um, and the way my preference, as far as what I tend to do for clients, and I, I want to acknowledge that, you know, you can buy buy to lets, you can do all sorts of things. But, you know, something that is going to generate you, uh, something that generates a rising income and a rising capital value over time, that's an ideal asset. So my personal favorite is global equities, because at the end of the day, they never call you at 4 a.m. in the morning. I think it's a wonder class of, it's, I think it's the best asset class in the world, is the truth. It comes with volatility, but, you know, it's completely hands-free. Um, and then once we've done that, we can consider, okay, let's invest in assets, property, bonds, equities, all the kind of stuff the typical financial kind of planner or the personal finance guru would say. How can we then leverage the tax position? So there was some research from the Taxpayers Alliance which indicated that in direct and indirect taxes, an individual a household, sorry, I should say, will pay over £1.2 million in their lifetime in taxes. That is a lot. And that's things like VAT, that's things like taxation and so forth. So how can we use the tax system to our advantage? And this is very simple. This is, you know, I acknowledge it's really difficult for like a 20 year old to be like, put some money into your pension. But when I'm speaking to someone who's younger, what I will tend to say is, okay, do you care about being financially free at some point? The answer normally would be, yeah, actually, yeah, I do. I'd, I'd really like to be in a position where I have the freedom to choose whether to work or not. If that's the case, then okay, so one of those sections where you're going to be financially independent is going to be in later life. And pensions are incredibly, incredibly tax efficient because your employer puts in. But also, if you think about the fact that you've got a pound of extra earnings today, well, you don't get the full pound. So depending on your tax rate, you might be in a position where if your basic rate, you'll get 20% income tax, 8% national insurance. So you're down to 78p. If you're higher rate, you'll get 40% tax, income tax, and 2%. So now you're going to get 58p in the pound. So if we think about that trade-off between, okay, so I've got money that I can spend today, and if you enjoy it, and you know it's something that helps you live your life, you absolutely should do. But if we then frame that another way and say, okay, well, what happens if I contribute to a stocks and shares ISA? What happens if I maybe contribute salary sacrifice into the pension? So you now save on the income tax and the national insurance. So your pound that was maybe if you're a higher rate taxpayer going down to 58 now remains at a pound. The difference between that 58p versus what you could maybe invest and get a 5% real return over 30 years is 6.3 times. Put very simply, 
to get five thousand pounds into your pocket if you use salary sacrifice, you theoretically could get 25, 30 grand. Thirty grand. Yeah. And that's a year of your Marshmallow life. Marshmallow study. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and what I'm kind of what I try and encourage my younger clients or all my clients, but it works specifically well with younger clients because it's it's uh, harnessing compounding. Is let's try and think about this as buying time because you really care about your financial freedom. And when you're making that trade-off, let's not try and ignore the fact that it's going to be really difficult to make those sacrifices today, but let's try and reframe it because my job as an advisor is basically to make these little behavioral things so I can get a good outcome. We want to, let's try and interpret in a way that if you are going to give up that five grand net, it's going to be giving you a year of your life later. And things like that, I think, can be really powerful. Instead of saying to someone, took 10 grand in your pension and let it run you're basically saying for every pound you give me the pension the, the, give the pension it will give you five six back yeah. and, uh, and that can equate to your life a year of your, your life, life or whatever and of course it's it's not guaranteed and five percent real is you know so the history is um from 1900 to 2022 global equities have done 5.3 real that's from the dimson marsh and Staunton data so it's it, you'd have to aggress invest aggressively and it's obviously not guaranteed but the fundamental thing that I'm, I'm mentioning here is it's just about try not to think about retirement as this kind of abstract, oh, I'm just putting money into my pension and it's just going to disappear forever. Actually, it's just an unlock to unlock time for yourself later. And time will go quick in you imagine. At 25, it's it's the distant future. At 35, you're like, oh God, that's not far away. I'm chucking money in my pension now thinking, oh, I'll have that in no time. Yeah. You know, it, it doesn't feel that long. Do you think... A compounding is one of these things that's it's the eighth wonder of the world, as people say with Einstein and stuff. Do you think that the narrative is oversold? Do you think that it's this thing that everyone can rely on long term? Well, it's, it's kind of the closest thing to magic we have in the investing world because it, it does give exponential results. However, uh, the issue with the traditional financial industry is that it's all... Um, it is benefited by assets. You know, assets are what drive the financial industry and financial advice. But actually, the reality of the matter is, going back to that 5% real return, if you put aside some money, it takes 14 years, generally, if you get a five real return, for the growth to catch up with how much money you're putting in today. So for the compounding, for that growth to equate to the money you're putting in today, it takes about 14 years. You mean like 100% return? Yeah, that that yeah for, to for it to basically, yes, for it to basically yeah. double, yeah, yeah. effectively. Um, now, what's the problem? What's the insight from that? Not the problem, but the insight. Well, actually, your contributions have to do the heavy lifting. The contributions are the most valuable thing in the earlier years. And we're so focused on, um, you know, we're so focused, especially if you really like finance, like everyone around this table does, so focused on how can I eke out that little extra percentage? The actual... Um, best advice in many cases is how can I improve my income? Which is the income focus. Yeah, yeah. which is no, the income so focus. Let's no, move that. That's the, that was a smooth so, transition. What, what, what was the income go on? So it was about income, <laughs> which is the second of the three things. Yeah. So, so basically, um, I'm a big believer, you know, if you saw yourself as an asset, which is, I think is probably important, your ability to earn is the most valuable asset on the table. You know, if you think about, um, there's loads of people that talked about this and sort of like time millionaires and all the rest of it. But what's a young person got that somebody who's at 65 doesn't have time? And the, what does that mean? What are the conclusions from that? Well, your income is one of the most important things. So as a planner, you know, would I say that somebody who's 23-year-old should be sacrificing more money to squirrel into a pension at the cost of maybe training, experience, life, things that are going to generate an income later? I'm not sure if I would. And it's another key way to build wealth because there is a direct correlation. Basically, if you if you don't have much income, it's very difficult from a planning perspective to work with that, is the truth. You know, you can only work around the edges and you can still get very good results compared to not planning effectively, but um, it's not going to make anywhere near the difference income does. We did an episode on um, how to get a raise and um, the specialist, I can't remember who it was, they came and told Wayne. us- Wayne, oh, you, you're good with names. Uh, Wayne yeah. came and told us that you should like change companies. Often you should uh, get a bit more experience. You've been Le following that advice. I've been following yeah. that advice. <laughs> but you, you leverage your experience so that if you change companies, you can then get a bigger salary and then you stay there for a year or two, change companies, get a bigger salary. Whereas my parents, they both stayed in their jobs for like, 
20, 30, 40, my mom's still a doctor, like 40 years in the same profession or same company. But I feel like nowadays, like Damien was in debt collection and then now... Debt collection? Debt management. Debt management. Debt management. Sounds know. a lot worse, <laughs> debt collection. He was, he was a heavy... I, 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 worked in, I worked for in insolvency, so... Yeah, yeah we, so then he changed to YouTube. So like, I feel in our generation, people change jobs a lot more frequently than our parents and therefore you can get more income by changing companies and changing directions. Yeah. One thing, so, you know, whenever we talk about things like time, investment, putting stuff in, people people always say, I don't have any money. And I know you've caveated before, but I want to say to people that when we're talking about things like income focused, time is an asset you can spend. Correct. And it's one that doesn't require capital in the sense of pounds or dollars or whatever your domestic currency is. And sometimes if someone's sat there going, I can't invest, I can't put any money into my pension, but then they can spend their time on generating an income, can't they? And yeah. that's what I did. I don't think people realize that I spent, I think my YouTube channel cost me about a hundred pounds to get started to the point where it outran my job, where I was on a hundred grand a year. Um, that was, the, that was the, the investment, but the time investment was 50 hours a week, you know, around my full-time job. Yeah, yeah. So if we view our time as an asset, like we view money, we can spend time to increase the amount of money we earn and then we can pour that into an asset focused approach. Yeah, exactly. And and you know, these are not mutually exclusive. These are just important to be aware of, of the leaves. And I did exactly the same. You know, I used to do music and then I f f kind of fell into the advice profession. And for the first kind of like five years in advice, or well, actually the first decade journey, the one of the biggest investments I had was me, you know, was basically getting more qualified, getting, you know, working my way up. And um it makes things much easier if you can do that. Not obviously everyone can, but if you can, it's it's a lever. I know you're not an expert on this, but do you have any advice or personal experience on some of the best ways to improve earnings? Yeah, I, I think ultimately you should have a look at yourself being one of your biggest investments. And what you can do practically, I guess, is you can have a look at your current job and where the ceiling limit is. I think that's a really practical thing to do first as far as, okay, where is my trajectory going to be for my career? Is it likely that I'm going to get uplifts and so forth? And that probably should be a conversation to have. I know you've done a fantastic episode on how to get a pay rise. It should be a regular conversation to have with your employer if you're taking an employed route. But then that, that's probably going to give you a key bit of information which you can use, which is, okay, what is my likely peak earnings? You know, what, what's the great outcome look like? From there, you can then make a decision about whether you're in the right industry for a, a mixture of reasons. Lifestyle can really play a part. And then you can consider whether you want to pivot or double down where you are. Yeah, if you've got no money though, and you're sat there saying, none of these conversations for me, they are. And I just want to stress this point, you've got time and you can use that time to increase your earnings and have that focus. So... Do you think, you know, asset focus, income focus, we'll come into lifestyle in a second. Are these exclusive, are these like separate or do they all work together or? Yeah, so so they're absolutely not. And it's just a framework to think about things because so it's with content, especially online, that it, it favors people being dogmatic and just being like, you should always do this. You should always do this. And that's just not true. These are kind of to be flexed in the seasons of life. So there's going to be a point in your life maybe where you can save more and that's really where to bring on good financial habits. There's going to be a point maybe where you go all in on your career and trying to increase your income. There's going to be a point where actually neither is really possible. So it's about optimizing your lifestyle and maybe seeing if you can keep things going that way. It's not mutually exclusive. You know, what is wealth? And, and for me, wealth kind of encompasses health, relationships, time and money. Because at the end of the day, and it's not just about financial, because if you don't have health, then obviously everything kind of just becomes irrelevant. Harvard Grant study, the one of the longest studies on human happiness and well-being, found effectively that not having good relationships is as bad for you as drinking and smoking. So that makes a huge difference. Money, the truth of the matter is, is if there's economic strain in the household, you're more likely to get divorced. You're more likely to have stress. Um, and also time, you know, Warren Buffett, um, one of the greatest, if not the greatest investor of all time, billionaire, 94. Did he swap it all just to go back to 20, I bet, you know, we give it all away to go again. Exactly. And and that's, I think the, the kind of thing for the listener to think about is that, you know, what is what is their definition of wealth? That is just mine. It's very personal. You know, what about you guys? Do you do you have a particular thought on what you see wealth as? Gold watches for you too. To behave. Uh, I like, I do like gold watches. <laughs> um, the things you don't think about are actually really important. Being healthy, um, having a good relationship, having a good partner, having good friends. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, that's more wealth. And obviously you don't want to have some money to go to a few chalets and, you know, a few <laughs> holidays now and again, a few boats. But, you know, generally, I think you can a be really- boats. A few boats. <laughs> not, not 
stop buying them. Just like go, go on a couple of yachts now and again. Just, just, a, few yachts. Yachts. just a few yachts. Just a few yachts. I, I, I think it's kind of California. I went to, on some cool crypto yachts and they were really they were really fun. So yeah, I, my, I want to go on some more yachts. They're fun. You must be a nightmare to pump for, mate. <laughs> there is no plan. Yeah, yeah. There is go no with the flow. No, Enjoy yeah, yourself. Yeah, he's doing all Carpe right. DM. Carpe <laughs> DM. Okay, cool. That's what. Don't book him with me. Don't book him with me. Or Carpe Noctum sees the night. Carpe Omnia sees it all. Or sees it all. I yeah, know. is it Omnia? I don't know. But I, I would add purpose to that. So like, you know, health, money, fam, whatever. But I would I would add purpose in terms of I, I, I generate a lot of happiness now out of having a career that I feel is impactful and meaningful versus, you know, I think a lot of people can have all of those other elements and then be unhappy about their day job, which I think is what you said about the whole giving up 30 years to finally live. Yeah. I think a sense of purpose and... Mm -hmm meaning is is something that makes me very happy yeah yeah and and the reason why all that is so important is because you know my, my expertise is planning and, and what should we be doing we should be working with the end in mind and you know one of the things i'd like the listeners to take from this conversation is that the big scary kind of things you see on the headlines as far as you know you'll never retire or whatever you do have the ability to to cater things um there is just something before we move on to from income focus i do want to mention because i know this is a topic of um of conversation a couple of weeks back as far as on the podcast but it's so essential to insure yourself and i just want to kind of double click on that because ultimately i know there'll be a lot of people who probably aren't and you know you always feel like you come across like grim reaper when you <laughs> say stuff like that's this. what the comments are like saying, yeah, 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 he's one like grim reaper. Yeah. <laughs> um but the, the stats are shocking i always never wanted to kind of be like the hard sell on anything like that but it was it didn't take very long for you to realize that if you look after 100 clients, the reality of the matter is if you don't push for them to protect themselves, you will have five, six, maybe 10 of those individuals who something serious will happen. And the difference between them being okay and their family being okay and not could have been you having a proper conversation about it. That's why I'm going to, I'm, we made the video on, on this channel. I'm going to do a main channel video and stuff. And I'll probably get called, you know, a harbinger of doom and all of this. Yeah, but yeah. I think if, if, if a few people go out, I mean, I, I got smacked in the face by a complete stranger on a night out. If I'd have fallen an inch to the left or right, I probably wouldn't be in the state I am now, which is, you know, done okay. Um, and I didn't even see it coming. You know, like I didn't, I didn't see that come in. There was just nothing I could have done to protect myself. And then you're not even talking like cancer and things, which is, the, the, it's gone in my lifetime it's gone from it will touch one in four to 50 percent of people are getting it you know you're paying the premiums hoping that you never claim yeah. which is such a weird setup but you know think about it the other way around imagine just put yourself in a second in that headspace the difference between going okay this is going to be really tough but financially i'm going to be okay that's enormous. Do you think there's a point in your life where it doesn't make sense so say in your 20s and 30s when you don't have much in assets probably you're quite sensitive you know to to something bad happening but if you're approaching 50 and you've got a couple million oh, yeah, do, do yeah. you think i don't need to be insured yeah, yeah, I've, I've got loads of like re clients who are at retirement who are at financial freedom where I'll, I'll have a conversation i'll say you know you could do you maybe you've got an inheritance tax issue whatever but you, you don't need it you're financially independent and your kids are no longer dependent so absolutely as you get older that's the whole point of like the insurance especially income protection which is like a real wonder product you know people really should consider getting that because ultimately, if you, especially if you get it early, things will happen to you over that time. And it's basically what you're doing is you're insuring the most valuable asset, which is your human capital. Having an income-focused approach, it's all nonsense if you then suddenly get some unexpected illness and can't build your income. The biggest change in the finance space in the last couple of years has probably been interest rates. We're now in this new era, having been at historically low rates for over a decade. The downside is we've seen mortgage rates increase, but the upside is we've seen savings rates increase as well. The funny thing is though, a lot of people, particularly business owners, have been slow to jump on this increase in rates. Are you getting a good interest rate on the cash that's sat in your business bank account? I wasn't until recently. This is why I'm happy that we're partnering with Tide. They offer an instant access savers account where new customers get 4.33% AER variable on unlimited deposits until at least March 31st, 2025. If you're interested in putting the money in your business account to work, head to tide.co forward slash savings. There's a link in the description for you. For the full offer T's and C's and Tide's terms, visit tide.co forward slash terms and the variable rates are correct as of the 1st of October, 2024. There was another one. So, oh, which yeah. is the lifestyle focused. 
This is the one that Jermaine's going to want to hear. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very anti this one, but yeah, go ahead. Anti? Isn't <laughs> yeah. this all about living? No, it's, oh, not okay. about, it's all about saving saving money, like downsizing a little bit. So, a little bit frugal. No, actually, this is, it wasn't. So the interpretation of this is basically just to acknowledge that there are going to be some people who don't want to kind of go all in on assets and maybe might not be able to build up their, their income. And therefore, there is another option, which is that we just go, okay, we might not be able to build huge assets. We might, you maybe you'd be in a job that you love, but just doesn't pay that well. And to be honest, if you're in a job you love, you're kind of optimizing, you, you're nailing it. Loads of people hate their job, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, so it's just to say that there is another way where you can consider how can I craft my lifestyle in a way that I might be reliant on my income. I might need to maybe even work longer. But if I can potentially do that in a way which does at least build some wealth, then that's ultimately my focus is going to be on maximizing my lifestyle now. And another example might be there might be times in your life where it's you need to drop a day to look after the kids or whatever. So you're going to take a step back from maybe an asset focus or an income focus, and you're going to be really optimizing on your lifestyle. These things are not mutually exclusive. But I just kind of wanted to throw that in there as an additional lever, additional option, because I speak to people about their retirement all the time. And there have been cases where it's like, you know, you can't retire at 62, you just don't have the money or whatever it may be. But you can, if you do three days a week and you're happy to go to 70, you know, you've got some savings. What about a career change? Because if you can do that and if you're happy to do that, then you're going to be absolutely fine. And sometimes people just don't think about that. They don't think about, okay, how can I adapt my lifestyle so that it potentially fits around maybe needing more income for a period? Um, but yeah, that's really key and it's just another lever. Yeah, I, you know, a lot of the narrative online that I see is, you know, work out your hourly rate and price how much your time's worth. And then any task that is below that, outsource it, you know, get cleaners, blah, blah, blah. And I did this for a time. And then I started to look at tasks like hanging out with mates. It's like, oh, this is, I should invoice these pricks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> you know, do you know what I mean? And, and you start to... You start to, it's important to kind of define the life you want and what's Correct. important outside of just earning money. Otherwise, in a cost benefit analysis, all I should ever do is work. Whereas, you know, spending time with my son and one day or two days a week, I'd give up any ability to earn money to sit with him and have a good time with him. And as I look back on my life, I don't remember the days I work, I remember the time with him. And I think that kind of lifestyle one is. I think it's really important for people to to have that conversation with themselves. Yeah, work with the end in mind. That that's the key thing. I mean, I like the whole enjoying the journey as part, like not just of a time. We know you so do. Like, yeah. <laughs> he does it well, though. I mean, like because like, I, I work from home, so I get to spend yeah, like yeah. every day with my son. Or sometimes it's annoying yeah, yeah. when I'm trying to be on the Zoom call <laughs> and he's just like dad, dad. But I'm like, yeah, this is my joint closer. He's gonna be your account manager. Yeah. But um, like I do enjoy like I think every day you should enjoy yourself. So like yeah, even yeah. if you're working your ass off, you should still be having fun while you're doing it, or you should enjoy life at the same time. So yeah, I definitely think that the lifestyle one is a little bit interesting, but I think we can also work till longer, depending on your, like nowadays we can do some like remote jobs, um, less manual labor jobs when you're older. So you can, can kind of work for a bit longer, which I think will be probably something I do. Cause I, th I heard that when people retire, some people, bit more bit die because they're like they I'm don't have sure a... all people die after retire. <laughs> after <they> retire. <laughs> <laughs> but i mean like soon after they retire i don't know if you know any stats but like because they don't have a purpose anymore they're kind of just like yeah so so i don't have an immediate stats but you, you see it you know what i mean as, as a planner you, you see it it's the truth you know um, they've got nothing to you do you see people deteriorate yeah once they retire. Uh, you know I've, so you know and some some have a great retirement but I think what often tends to happen, it kind of goes back to that sort of wealth definition, is that if people have neglected other areas, maybe their health, maybe their relationships or whatever, and they've had a really stressful job and then they've gone, right, doom. They don't have anything to kind of fulfill that time, you know, and they're going around the golf course again. And, and that obviously might be great for your leisure activity, but how great is it going to be if you're doing that for the third time a week with mm. the same people hearing the same jokes? <laughs> and I think that's really key. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, having that purpose and, not every job is um, is flexible. Not every job is work from home. Not every job is, you know, is... So I, I think there's going to be people who have, you know, like building or whatever, very manual jobs. Who will say, you, we can't possibly go to 60 or 70, and mm. that would be fair enough. But what what's our opportunity for our generation? Because I always try and, I try and think about this because I think it's a positive way to frame it. And I often think, okay, what's our version of house prices? So, like, you know, if we look back in 30 years, there will be an opportunity now that we think... 
I wish I'd been proactive about that opportunity at its infancy. And I don't have any immediate answers. Um, but one of the things clearly is this, you know, this flexible work, working from home mobility, that has changed the dynamic. You know, we, we catastrophize, it's doomsday. You follow the media and everyone is talking negative. I think we need to give ourselves a break and think the long-term trend of I, I, I earn money and it continues to grow a little by little each year will probably continue as well. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, and it's great to have the people on from, you know, because I listen to all these podcasts as well about people on talking about these big structural issues. And it's not to underplay that. We do have real undersaving issues. We have a the old age dependency ratio is going to be a real problem. There are loads of problems, but for the listener... Uh, and how I would act as a planner, which is really the area that I have expertise in, is, okay, fine, how are we going to deal with this as an individual? What's the lifestyle you want? How can we craft that? And what are the levers we can use to get you the result you want? And then he seamlessly slides into the levers. Let's talk, <laughs> let's talk about that. This is why, just on that point, though, I, you know, there's, there's someone like me who talks about that these are the how-tos, these are the very practical steps. I do talk broadly as well, but I always try and ground it in the individual. And I do think it's important to empower the individual because I, I do. Th I still personally believe that even though the system is unfair, even though inequality is there, even though there's mass corruption, I still think that an individual can drag themselves up a few pegs in terms of financial security with, with basic information. So let's talk about some of the levers now that you've outlined. Some of these are going to seem quite basic, yep. but, but I think people want a magic answer, don't they? Of yeah, like, they you do. know, put your money here and it'll, it'll 10x yeah. in a day. It's not like that. This is a financial planner, someone whose job it is to do this thing, saying these are the things that you can do in your life to improve your finances. The first one we've got is, you would probably call this fire or... Yeah, so, so, so one of the options, so th these are just the options without any judgment, um, but one of them is just basically spend less and save. That's the frugal view. So, you know, what, what's that on a practical basis? You look at you, your expenditure, you go through everything, you go, okay, what could I potentially cut back on? What do I not need? As far as kind of habits, good financial habits to do that, automate is key. If you can, that's one of the biggest hacks I can give you for a younger person, which is that once you have a direct debit, as long as you're not going into debt and, you know, you, you're not in a position where if you have it automated on the day of your pay, you know, you need to pay yourself first. That's one of the key, key things to do. So if you have a direct debit going out for an amount that you can reasonably save on the point you get paid, you wouldn't believe how quickly you adapt to that money going out. It just becomes an automated thing. So automate, that's absolutely crucial. I don't like it as a long-term strategy unless that's your bag, unless you're just one of those people that love the frugal stuff because you only cut to an extent. And where I think you start getting into a position of is you get into a position where you're you're compromising on the quality of life. And again, that's sort of, you're not living for today as much and that's not ideal, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, if you want to see the power of automation, it's every business on the planet wants you to set up a direct debit with them because Correct. they know the chances of you cancelling once you have that in place are very low. Correct. So use that to your... The, the, just do the heuristics, the, psycho, <laughs> the psychological bias of once it's in place, you, you probably won't cancel it. Well, the, what you just said there is actually really important that I want to kind of focus on is that what, what's happening, you have the smartest people in the world that are doing everything they can to make sure that you don't save and invest for your future. That's the truth. They're flooding with Instagram, TikTok, and all the rest of it. How can we use human behavior to our advantage so we make good decisions? So whether that's automating, I'm a big fan of Roundup apps. I can't give you any recommendations because that's me getting into murky water. But I use Roundup apps where you just basically, you know, how can you trick yourself, so to speak, to practice good financial habits? Chase, Monzo, um, there's a few. Moneybox, I think. We can say Revolute. it because we're unregulated. But yeah, they, they have these Roundup features. So basically when you spend... Five pound ninety eight. Two p goes into a yeah. little savings. Anything part. you can, anything mm. you can to kind of do that thing. That's where you know. Going back to the thing I said at the start, if I could tell a twenty three year old to do anything, it's let's get your financial habits done. It doesn't matter if it's a tenner. Let's just let's just get them in place because it's like financial. It's like health habits. It compounds over time, and we can improve the practice over time as well. So these are like psychological nudges, you might yeah. call them as well. When auto enrolment was introduced, the pension scheme, which is the biggest nudge towards a financial habit probably the UK's ever done, yeah. they thought that maybe 20 to 30% of people would opt out because they basically said, before it was like, do you want the pension? Most people were like, nah, can't be bothered. Okay, we're going to put you in the pension and you then have to say if you don't want to be in it. That's the diff That's the shift. Only 10% of people opt out. So the nudge the the or you know the automation was even more successful than the the experts thought it would be 100% and and that's kind of going back to that kind of like buy time example it's it's all a mental game 
Everything is, but especially with your money. So how can we improve that? Next one is earn more and invest more. Pretty simple. Yeah, but it only works if you do the latter bit, which is, you know, earning more, going back to the income focus approach, that's really important, but you have to then use some of that surplus income for your future self, ultimately. You know, you can't just earn more and spend more. because no, then lifestyle creep. Yeah, because then all you're going to do is you're going to lifestyle creep. So the way to do this, if you can, again, if you can operate good habits from the start, is that you're going to have a lifestyle set at the moment. Hopefully, you're going to be in a position going forward where you're going to earn a little bit more money. When that happens, can you go, okay, you know, maybe I've got a five grand pay rise. Could I maybe sacrifice half of it? You know, can I speak to my employer and go, just put that aside? You won't, like the automations, you won't notice it if you put this in place. And that can have an enormous impact on your future if you just continually do that. One thing that helps me with that kind of stuff and someone on a variable income is to have fixed rules. So I have like a fixed cost base that I know I need X amount of money each month to live. Anything above that that I earn, 50% I save, 50% I blow. And that, that's to safeguard my savings, but also to safeguard me living my life because otherwise I just won't spend any money. You know, I've been trying to improve. Hence, I'm wearing hence, that Abba t-shirt today. the message today. I sent you today. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm literally wearing that Abba t-shirt today as like a sign of, I would never have bought merch in the past. I'd be like, why would I buy merch? Like, the expensive t-shirt. Yeah, yeah, I went in there and spent like yeah, 80 quid on socks and t-shirts. Yeah. And I don't regret it all. <laughs> <laughs> I look amazing. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, fixed rules, that, that kind of... Because yeah. in the moment when the money hits your bank account, you either think, oh, I should save it all, or you think, oh, just think of what I could do with this money and, and it's gone before you know it. Yeah, and sometimes it might not be possible. Maybe, you know, having kids, maybe there's, there's going to be a million reasons. This is just tactics you can use. It's going to be a million times this isn't going to be possible. But if you can just have that mindset of, okay, maybe I will try and do this, I'll operate this at this point, then that makes all the difference. It's all about, it's the mentality and the habits. Okay, next we've got... Increasing returns, which yeah, is an interesting one. I think this is important to note just because, oh man, I'm going to butcher this stat. It was something like 72%, don't, I, I might misquote this, but 72% of people didn't know how their pension was invested. I think that's right. Um, I know, bet it's higher. I mean, it I sounds bet, about 20, right. It could be 28% higher. 28% of people are lying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but as a planner, it makes such an enormous difference. If you go, you know, I, I hate how people always overstate, you know, returns. People go 10% returns, 12% returns. There's no historical precedent for that. So I always like to bring it back down to reality. You know, that's why I like using that 5% real because there's actually history behind that. But very simply, if you're invested in a way that can get you 5% real, that's after inflation compared to 3% real, over a 30-year period, there's almost going to be double the amount of money you're going to have. Not quite, but almost double from the difference between those two things. Most people aren't necessarily, check well, not most people's generalization, but a lot of people aren't checking what their money's doing for them. And that that mistake is going to compound as well. How, how can people improve returns then? So ultimately, <laughs> this comes back to the episode that I listened to with your guy yesterday. Um, I, as an advisor and a person where I can't give anyone specific advice, um, Individual stocks is not the way to go, in my view, at all, in any way, shape, or form. Uh, yeah, you message me going, I don't like this one. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think against the guy personally, fundamentally, I disagree. And the reason why I do think I've got a dog in this fight is that I speak to people who are 40s and 50s who are like, I really need to retire. And then we look at unpack the finances. Oh, you've decided to be smart price Warren Buffett. And we've got a load of kind of different shares in a different point. And Ultimately, it can really damage you to not necessarily get the growth that you want. And the evidence behind it is that individual shares are a lottery. You know, I know you've done the Henrik Bessenbinder study effectively, yeah. but that effectively shows he looked at assets, share, individual shares from 1990 to 2018. And what he found is that between 55 and 62% underperformed one month treasury bills, which is basically cash. So he's held it for 28 years. It's basically underperformed cash. Interestingly, only 1.4% of the stocks in that were basically um, part of the total wealth creation. So what that basically means between treasury bills, so basically what that means is the stocks, the 1.4 who did incredibly well, basically counted for all of the excess returns versus cash. What's the insight there? It's a lottery, is the truth. Needle in the haystack. It's a needle in the haystack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the truth. And I'm, I have a money pit and I call it a money pit. And sometimes my clients have money pits, which is basically I go, okay, you can have, investing can be entertainment. There's nothing wrong with that. It's your life. But the odds are stacked highly, highly against you if you're going to do individual stock picking. So why don't we just acknowledge that and have a little bit of fun money? But from a planning perspective, 
I'm the guy who has to sit in front of somebody and tell them whether they can retire, whether they can do the things they really care about. I do not think it's right to put that at risk. So what does the evidence support? It's basically your returns will be dictated by as long as you're diversified. So that's low cost discipline, uh, whether that's an index fund or workplace scheme, which is ultimately well diversified across assets across the world. Equities, all the history shows you, has the highest chance of return long term. So the stock market. The stock market, effectively. Well diversified equities. I believe it's a wonder asset because ultimately what you're doing is you're owning fragments, little bits of the great companies in the world, ultimately. And it's one of the only asset class that can compound onto itself. So if you have a company that earns 20% return on equity, that then grows, the pie grows, and it compounds onto itself going forward. But what you're tapping into is the greatest minds in the in the world, effectively waking up every day with the sole purpose of profit. And you're able to do that with a couple of clicks and a button. So equities drive the returns. They also drive the volatility. You can tamper that volatility with things like bonds, properties, and all the rest of it. But that is going to take away from your return. And then what about other actions, say, specifically, you mentioned pensions, 78% people, whatever the stat is, that don't, don't know what's in it. What steps can they take to improve the returns maybe inside of their work-based scheme? So first thing is check. Check, you know, as in look at what you're invested in. Is this a, a lifestyle fund? Have you been, because so uh, I believe it's Nest, but I might be wrong, so don't, don't hold me to that, is that it has a foundational scheme where effectively you're in lower risk return and lower return assets. My question to an individual would be, if you know this investment's going to be for 40 years or 30 years, how much does volatility matter over the five or 10? Just a question. I'm not putting any opinion on that. Is it not the case that the real risk is low returns? Because that basically money is freedom and choice at the end of the day. And if you're not maximizing the returns you can, are you potentially leaving growth on the table when, especially with a pension, you can't access the money anyway? Mm -hmm. So check the pension, look at the asset allocation, is the as is what you are invested in in line with your goals? If you want growth, is it in line with a fund that's going to give you growth? If you don't want to see volatility, is it in line with a fund that isn't going to give you as much volatility? I can't, as an advisor, I can't be too specific on that, but that's what you need to consider. Yeah, the... Um I think it's an important point around the lifestyle. And so to explain, they de-risk in the early days. So they take less risk to expose you to less potential return. And their, their justification of this is they don't want to scare people early on because they think people will bolt. Yeah. But they're in a pension product they can't take the money out of in an auto-enrollment scheme at a job that dictates where their pension is. So they can't actually really leave that and easy. And only 20% of the people know they're in... Yeah, they don't even know what it's in anyway. Yeah, so... I think it's the worst case of nanny state um, setup. Yeah. Um, we should all, all of all of the decent creators, so like you, James Shack, I'll kind of do some, we should all band together and do a campaign. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you're not invited to. Yeah, you're not invited to. <laughs> <laughs> Start a YouTube channel. I'll just be there for lunch, mate. It's cool. I'll just, I'll just turn up for the food. <laughs> <laughs> and the next the next one then was um save tax which oh yeah you, you have touched on yes yeah, so, so that's basically tax is probably going to be your biggest expense beyond you so how can we leverage the tax position how can we leverage things like employer match i kind of already touched upon that in the buy time but it's so so important what would you say the biggest mistake people make in taxes I think I'd probably say leaving money on the table, so to speak, or more, more specifically kind of tax relief on the table, because it's it's really difficult, and I want to acknowledge this, to kind of think about yourself in some abstract retirement point and then make additional contributions to pensions. But just very simply, you know, if you have a pound, then if you're a high rate taxpayer, you're going to lose 40p of that pound to income tax and then 2% under current legislation to national insurance your tax bill is going to be the largest thing you're going to pay beyond your own living expenses across your life. So the question is, how can we use tax wrappers? So that's things like pensions, incredibly tax efficient. We won't do a deep dive on pensions, but obviously we've discussed that. You've discussed that in other episodes. Things like lifetime ISAs, if you're investing using stocks and shares ISAs, it's just ultimately looking at, okay, what are the key wrappers that I have and how can I use them effectively? And then even not claiming that allowance, the amount of people who are high rate taxpayers who pay into a pension and then don't claim the self-assessment tax relief at the end is mental. Correct. Billions a year. Yeah, yeah that's correct. Uh, reducing your burn. Yes. Yeah, so, so how does that differ from spend less and save? Well, one's on the way up, reducing your burns on the way down, so to speak. So, you know, for example, if you're in a position where you're coming to retire, a thing that my comments uh, mentioned yesterday, which is absolutely right, is that, you know, okay, you've, you've gone for 31,300 for a single person as a moderate lifestyle. I don't need that. 
and there's going to be a ton of people in in, um, in the country where that's going to be too much. So is are we in a position where actually when we adjust your expenditure for what you're going to need at a certain point, can we reduce things down? Is it, you know, what do we need effectively and can we reduce those expectations? So you might be planning to retire and ideally you'd like 50 grand a year. But if you could retire at 40 and maybe not have the huge holidays, but have some good holidays, how much is that extra five years of your life where you've got the ability to do that? How much is that worth to you? Is it worth a compromise on lifestyle? The burn is, yeah, like you say, on the way down because you're burning your pile of cash that you've got. Yeah. Yeah, so reducing how much you're drawing down on Correct. that. Okay. Um, be more flexible. So we touched on this again, but I do want to I do want to have another conversation on it. Be more flexible on how you work or work longer. Yeah, and, and that's just the mass of compounding. So if anyone listens, and if you put into a compound interest calculator, it doesn't really matter at the figures, put in 30 years and then put in 35, what you'll see is you'll see that the difference between those extra five years has given you an exponential uplift because compounding really gets supercharged right at the end. What's the insight there? Well, the insight there is that if you can allow your investments to compound for longer, it's going to give you all the results towards the end effectively. So if you're in a position where you go, actually, do you know what, instead of the full stop at 60 or maybe 55 or whatever it may be, actually, I'm quite happy to do three days a week and that's going to cover my my income and it's going to be a different job, but it's going to be one which is quite lifestyle focused. I can enjoy it. Um, the additional five years of compounding is going to be huge. So that's another lever which you can consider. And but what do you see people, you know, what kind of difference does a year make? Enormous difference. Yeah. 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 I, I know this. So I want you to kind of like <laughs> yeah, yeah. it because I, I see it when I do cash flow modeling. Yeah. And stuff. 100%. It makes a huge difference. Um, and, and a year maybe is perhaps a little bit exaggerated. But if you think about the two things that are working next to each other as a planner, you're not drawing down on your investments. And sometimes, in, so your investments are compounding, but you're not drawing down on them. You might even be adding to them. So if I go and do a cash flow model for a client, and we kick the, you know, and for whatever reason, we're able to uh, elongate the point they're drawing on the investments for a couple of years, the difference can be enormous. Sometimes it can be like an extra five years of longevity on the funds. This next one's funny. Um, a capital event. <laughs> yeah, an inheritance, are you talking about? Well, it can, it, not just inheritance, it can be a ton of things. Uh, and I think it's important to note it because it can be something like some people can sell their business. Now, as a planner, you've got to be a bit careful because a lot of businesses don't sell. But a lot of people, their financial plan is built around an exit point. A lot of people, um, some people might want to downsize and that might be a legitimate strategy. I'm always slightly concerned about downsizing mm -hmm. because people don't tend to downsize hugely. But let's say you've got a big four bedroom house somewhere and you know, actually, do you know, we are going to downsize to a little flat or a two bed or something that can produce some capital. So again, another lever, uh, I do have clients who are downsizing from a decent sized house in London to something smaller. And that is going to make a big difference. And of course there's inheritance, but as a planner, I don't tend to use inheritance unless it's obvious it's going to land very soon because care, because disinheritance, because of all those things that can happen. What kind this, of age do people get inheritance? Do you yeah. want to ask what disinheritance I was going to ask is? what disinheritance what? what? What's disinheritance? When you don't like someone, you like <laughs> you don't get anything now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so basically you can somebody can change the will as long as they've got mental capacity pretty much any time. What, what age do people tend to get inheritances? Well, here's the, here's the thing, you know, everyone talks about the fact that millennials are going to um, inherit a huge amount but the issue is, is that when millennials are projected to inherit it it's going to be at the point with like 60 65 so it's not something that you're necessarily going to want to use as a financial plan um yeah it's it's something if i had a client who came to me and said i'm counting on this inheritance in 30 years time i'd be i'd, I'd just say do not do that because there's so many things that can change the care system can change all that kind of stuff yeah they could do i think that that point's worth stressing that most the care is 700 uh, to a thousand pounds a week for basic care this oh, yeah. is assuming just just being in a care home not talking about like dementia care and things like this yep. that if if life expectancies are where they are and your relative lives for 10 years in that system that it's going to cost a house to, yep. to, to fund it and you're not going to make the decision of oh well i want that inheritance so just Fuck them. <laughs> you know I mean? Which brings us on to the next one, which is <laughs> brutal. Di die brutal. sooner. Brutal. Die sooner. Nice you, you motivation. Yeah. You're, you're eight out of nine. Die sooner. I was like, okay, well, I'm sure there's a positive spin we can put on yeah, this. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, well, the bottom line is that, yeah, I should, probably shouldn't do this one. Uh, the no, we, do, we should. What you, I think it's an important lesson around longevity. Well, it's, 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 so basically, the, the kind of the jokingly bit in this is that everything is projected. You know, as a planner, I'll, I'll go to 100 because ultimately that can be a legitimate um, longevity for someone. That's how long they can live. But life expectancy varies hugely across the country and life uh, longevity is completely dictated by your own health. Mm. So it would be wrong to plan for a situation where you've got someone in dreadful health and you're going to 100. And you don't want to necessarily then be in a position where you're going at 60. Okay, we can't do the things we want to do because we're running you to 98, but you've got a host of health issues. So we, you, there needs to be some balance. You can't be too prescriptive with that. I think it's important to say that statistically there's a 51% chance that a couple, one of them will go to age 90. So if you have a couple, there's almost a more than 50% chance that one of those individuals will live to age 90. It's 100% not going to be you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> mate, I do a lot of exercise is, and a lot of drinking. Yeah. I do a lot of exercise. I'm a health, healthy, yeah, you are, healthy lad. You are, you are in good yeah, so, yeah, so, so you think the average is in the late 90s? Averages, is, there's no such thing as about average yeah. life expectancy. And you, you've got to kind of acknowledge that. Um, however, if we go back to kind of the core message, which is, can you rely on inheritances? Should you? I think the answer is no. The die younger is the is the opposite side of the coin of work longer, right? It it's is. just shorten the time frame. And you, I know it's a bit tongue in cheek. Uh, there's this, um, I might have spoken about it before, but there's this thing that the Ministry of Defence write every few years, which is a future trends report. And they talk about the biggest threats as they see it to the global economy. Things like, um, if we don't use AI for weapons, our enemies will. Like these kind of things. The, the, the advancement in biotech will mean that there might be enhanced soldiers. And if we don't use enhanced soldiers, maybe our enemies will. Sure. But they also talk about the fact that they believe there will be an advancement in medicine that extends life in the same way that antibiotics did. As soon as antibiotics invented were invented, life expectancy just went like that. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, because people stopped dying of infection. It wasn't that people live longer, it's like on average. But, you know, these trends are there. That I hear now that if you're our age, it's like one in 10 that you live to 100. Younger, our child's age, they think it's even higher. So yeah. this is why we're saying- yeah, we're One in 10. One in 10 live to 100. Yeah. I mean, I think in, in, in 20 years, there'll be double the amount of over 80s that there are right now because the aging population effect, mm -hmm. you know, and- People are living longer because medicine's keeping them alive longer. Yeah. And they're not necessarily in better health. They're just, you know, they're in poor health with high high care requirements, oh, damn. bleeding down their assets and then living for longer. So these people that are sat there going, oh, I'm going to inherit the house from Chelsea. Well, it's like, well, actually, it's all been spent on care and oh. you're getting it when you're 70. There's a great book called The 100 Year Life. And it basically talks about the fact that a child born today has a very good probability of getting to 100 because of medical advances. So everything we're doing really, you know, my, my core message kind of what we're talking about really is the retirement that our parents had probably is not going to be the same shape of retirement that we have. So how can we use our opportunities and not be anchored to the position that they're in? The final one you've got here is combination. Yeah, and, and I think that's probably the one that's going to apply to the most people here. And and this kind of puts the bow on everything with the income-focused, asset-focused, lifestyle-focused, and also all these levers, which is that there's there's going to be no one single thing. Uh, it's going to be a combination of that. Some points you might be earning a little bit more. Some points you might have to drop down. Some points you have to be focused on your income. But the key thing is, and what a kind of a planner will look at doing if we're looking at kind of building out sort of a cash flow plan, is that we're trying to find out what do you want to achieve? What's the ideal goal? What's wealth to you? How can we then be goals focused so that we work with the end in mind so it caters to your, your goals? And then what are the levers that we can use which are suitable to you, which is going to be individual for each person, so that we can craft a life that fits around the challenges of longevity, of all the rest of it. The message I kind of want to put across to people is I think it's an opportunity, but you've got to be open to seeing it that way. How can someone get started, do you think? Because we've gone through that, and I think well, it's really practical. And like I said, people want sexy answers. What I think you're best at, George, is giving realistic ones and realistic, like, these are the things that you can do. If someone's sat there now, how do they get started? Um, I think firstly, well, it depends what point they're starting at. Um, what I would say, for, to be honest, the thing that they're doing best is the most important thing, which is educate yourself, which is actually listening to podcasts like this, looking to the good content out there. Because actually going back to that kind of like income-focused approach, your knowledge about how to apply financial habits is the key thing. 
my message would be, it's up to you. So you do have to take that responsibility. Let's start with the basics. Let's have an idea of, okay, what do you spend now? Have you got control on the simplistic kind of more financial management areas? How can we then apply behavioral tactics so that we can improve the situation? Can we do that in a way which doesn't compromise your lifestyle? Are you potentially already use, are you using the tools at your disposal, employer match, pension contributions? Do we have an end in mind that we're going to work to? It's not about trying to get perfection. It's just about trying to be directionally correct. And how often should they be reviewing that plan? I, it's very difficult because life is when you're young, I think it's very, very difficult. You have to be directionally correct as opposed to precise because ultimately your life is going to change. My life in the last 10 years has changed yeah. remarkably, you know, way more than I ever would have thought. So I don't, I don't think it's about trying to, it's, it's kind of, we're looking at a future where we know things are going to be kind of refined as we go forward, but that's where the habits come in. So of course, yeah, review where you're at. Don't beat yourself up if you've, if something's happened, like, you know, you've had kids, so you're not able to do it right now. The key thing is just to get back on the horse when you can and start trying to build whatever life you want to from there. Because the, the one thing that I would say to someone young is it's up to you, you know, and I think that's the thing that there has been this shift where people could, I don't think our generation can fall into wealth unless you have money from your parents and you inherit it. I think we've got to do it ourselves. George was cool. I feel like we covered a lot in that episode. If you feel like you're going to struggle to you know, remember all of that, we've released a free newsletter series that you can sign up to using the link in the description, where each week we take you through the individual steps that you need to make to improve your financial lives.